Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Brooks from ElderWorks. We are very, very excited to have you here. The other benefit of this wonderful presentation is that we are going to be not only recording this presentation, but we will also be going on Facebook Live. So I'm very excited to introduce Julie Dillon from Stryker and Dr. Andrew Emke. Let's go ahead and go live on Facebook and Julie, you can take it away. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Katie. We're so excited to be here with you today. As Katie mentioned, my name is Julie Dillon. I work for Stryker Orthopedics. I have the coolest job in the world because I get to work with amazing organizations such as ElderWorks and fantastic surgeons such as Dr. Emke. So a few housekeeping items before we go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Emke. Uh, Dr. Emke is able to ask to answer your questions throughout the presentation, we will ask you to utilize the question and answer button or the chat button at the bottom. And Dr. Emke will pause throughout the presentation to take some of those questions. And at the end, we will also take additional questions that we did not get a chance to address during the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Emke. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Julie. Uh, thanks, Katie and ElderWorks for having me out here for this talk. Um, so uh, let me get my slides up here and we can get started. So this, this talk is gonna be about hip and knee pain. Um, so we're just gonna kind of go through the basics of hip and knee pain, mostly arthritis. And then uh, towards the end of the talk, we'll talk about um, surgical options. And I'm really excited to talk to you about that because uh, I'll be talking about robotic joint replacement, which is something I've really um, I love in my practice. I think it offers a lot of benefits. And I'm really excited to share with you guys uh, why robotic joint replacement, I believe, is the best way to have a joint replacement done. Uh, my name is Andrew Remke. I'm with Hinsdale Orthopedics. Uh, my, I have an office in, in Western Springs. I'm a, I'm a hip and knee replacement specialist. That's all I do in my practice. Um, and I uh, specialize in robotic hip and knee replacement as well. Um, I primarily operate at the Center for Advanced Joint Replacement, which is uh, part of LaGrange Hospital. I'm the director of orthopedic robotics there. Uh, I do also operate at a surgery center in Westmont where we do some outpatient joint replacements. Uh, I did my medical school locally in uh, Downers Grove in the Western suburbs and Midwestern University. Uh, and I did my orthopedic residency in Philadelphia. And then I did an extra year of training in Baltimore at the Rubin Institute of Advanced Orthopedics where I spent one year and all I did was learn about hip and knee replacement. So again, the kind of the flow of this is we're gonna talk about hip and knee pain and, and again, primarily arthritis. And we're gonna talk about um, some of the treatment options for that before surgery. Uh, and again, anytime anyone has a question, please, um, please feel free to come forward with it. I'm happy to answer questions during this. Any, uh, you know, anything about treatments or surgery, you know, everything we can go through. Uh, then we'll get into joint replacement surgery. So we'll just kind of go through a little of the basics of that. And then I'll kind of talk to you about why I like robotics and how that works. And then we can talk about what the recovery process is like. And then, of course, answer any questions at the end as well. So joint pain, especially of the hip and knee, can be very debilitating. Um, we use our, our hip and knee, our legs for everything we do with walking. Um, it's hard not to use them. Um, it's not like uh, one of our arms uh, where we can easily rest it and still get through our day for the most part. You know, we really need our legs to get up and moving. So it's, it's hard not to utilize them. When you have a disease or injury to your hip or knee, it can severely limit your ability to move and work. Because again, we need to move around. We have to be mobile during the day and it can be very limiting if we've got bad hip or knee pain. So joint pain can, can look a lot of different ways. Um, it can be constant. When it's severe, it can hurt all the time. In the early stages, it can be mild. It can come and go. Um, you can get it while you're active. Sometimes you feel good while you're active and then that comes after you rest for a while. Um, we can have it in one spot. We can have it in many spots. It kind of, it can present with lots of different flavors. 
So we'll just talk a little bit first about what a healthy joint looks like. And we'll, just, we'll talk about knee, but this can really apply to any joint in your body. And a joint is anywhere where two bones come together. So that can be your hip, your knee, your elbow, your fingers, your wrist, anywhere in your body where two joints come together, we consider that a joint. Now, if you look on the left of the screen here, you'll see what a healthy knee looks like. And we talk about um, arthritis and bone on bone and cartilage, and I'll kind of explain to you what those terms mean. So on this healthy knee on the left, you see this smooth, shiny white surface here. And this is the cartilage. So anywhere where two bones come together, there's cartilage at the end of the bones. So when those bones move back and forth against each other, they glide smoothly and they don't cause any pain or inflammation. Now, if you look over on the right, you'll see an example of a knee that has severe arthritis. If you look right here in this red spot, this is an area where there is no white, smooth white cartilage. This is an area where that cartilage has completely worn away and there's exposed bone underneath here. So this would be bone on bone arthritis. So the bone at the top here and the bone at the bottom here rub up against each other and it causes a lot of pain. So when we say bone on bone arthritis, that's what we are talking about. This is what it looks like on an x-ray. So every anytime somebody comes into my office to talk about pain, um, we get x-rays and we always go through the x-ray and I, and I can show them what's, where their arthritis is if they have any. So if you look on the left here, you'll see what a normal knee looks like, okay? You'll see that here's the top uh, of the knee, here's the bottom of it, and there's a space between it, okay? That's what a normal knee should look like. There is, that space that you see there is actually cartilage. It's not air, that's cartilage, but it just doesn't show up on the x-ray. So you can see a nice space here, a nice space here. Now, if you look over on the x-ray here on the right, this portion of it here, you don't see that space at all. You just see the two bones right up against each other. And that's an example of bone on bone arthritis. And that's what it looks like on an x-ray. You can see this piece of bone sticking out here. We call that a bone spur. That's part of the arthritic process as well. You don't see that over here. Everything looks nice and smooth. So there's lots of different reasons we can get joint pain. Um, a lot of times we get joint pain after an injury. So somebody falls, you know, let's say in their 20s, they tear their ACL or they have a serious injury or they break a bone. And years later, they develop arthritis there. We call that post-traumatic arthritis, meaning this is arthritis that came after a trauma. And during that trauma, the cartilage was injured. And so typically in that situation, the cartilage will wear out faster than it would normally once it's been injured. Um, it usually takes many years. Um, so a lot of times when I see somebody that comes in that's on the younger side with bad arthritis, maybe in their 40s or early 50s, oftentimes they've had some sort of an injury in their life that ultimately predisposed them to developing this earlier than they otherwise might have. Um, so a lot of, you know, we always get a lot of the same questions of, about uh, joint pain, um, you know, knee pain, for example, can knee pain in, uh, sorry, can joint pain in my knee cause pain in another joint in our back? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, the reason is, you know, once that knee really starts to hurt, it affects the way you walk. You start limping, you start walking differently. Other joints and other muscles start having to work a lot harder to pick up the slack. Um, especially when you start limping, it puts a lot of pressure through other areas of your body, everywhere from your ankle to your, to your hip, to your back. And it even can start to affect the other leg as you start to favor it more. So the longer it goes on, the longer the, um, the pain has a chance to set in and the more chance that your other joints are going to be affected by it. Um, this is always an interesting question. Uh, why does knee pain wake me up during the night? So you think you're resting, you know, why would my knee be painful? And what happens is during the course of a day with arthritis, as you're walking, your joint starts to build up inflammation inside of it. And actually in, in really bad cases, the bone itself will start to swell a little bit and become inflamed. So as you lay down at nighttime, uh, that inflammation is built up and it can take several hours for that to 
um, start to work itself out of its body, out of your body. And it's very sensitive too. So people will say, I roll over and I bump the inside part of my knee and it wakes me up. And it's because that inflammation has built up inside the, the joint during the day. And to me, when people are telling me that they're having night pain that wakes them up, I know that, that they have pretty advanced arthritis. So when you come into the office and we get x-rays and we determine that you do have some arthritis, we don't, we rarely ever talk about surgery as the first option. There's lots of things we can do before surgery in many cases to try to delay the need for needing a joint replacement. In some cases, we can prevent it altogether. Um, you know, something easy to do um, is, you know, make sure you're eating a well-balanced diet and incorporating um, low impact exercises. So if you start to develop arthritis, I'll usually recommend that people that are serious runners like to run a lot uh, for exercise, start to look at alternative ways to exercise. Um, Biking is great. Um, swimming is really good. Um, swimming is probably the best form of exercise for some of the arthritis because it takes all the pressure off the joint. Um, you can walk at a very brisk pace. You can walk on a treadmill very fast with an incline. It's really just the, the jogging, which causes impact on the bone over and over and over again. And that can start to wear it away potentially a little bit faster and maybe cause a little bit more inflammation than other, than other parts of uh, than other types of exercises. Um, you know, for some patients, especially people with more mild arthritis, uh, they're a little bit overweight, losing some weight can dramatically change the health of their painful joint. So one way I try to put in perspective is that every pound you lose takes four pounds of pressure off your knee uh, or hip. So every step you take is essentially four times your body weight. So if you can lose 10 pounds, that take 40 pounds of pressure off your hip or knee with every step. So um, there's some patients that are, um, that are quite overweight and they need to lose quite a bit of weight. And, it's, and it can be daunting, it can be discouraging and, and many of them have tried in their life to lose weight and have been unsuccessful. But I think this is a good way to sort of put it into small manageable units where if you can just lose 10 pounds, you're gonna, you're gonna start to see a difference in and your, and your hips and knees are gonna take a lot of pressure off of it. And so I think um, when people look at it that way, it, it becomes easier and I've seen a lot of people lose weight, um, chip away at it and their knee pain or hip pain will just go away. It's pretty amazing. Medications are a very common part of this and, and um, by far the most common we use are um, what are called NSAIDs or these are anti-inflammatories. So the most popular type are aspirin, um, ibuprofen, naproxen. These are all medications you can buy over the counter or get as prescriptions. Um, they all work essentially the same way, but with slightly different mechanisms. So some people respond better to one than others. So if you, you can kind of find, try one, try them, try different ones, find the one that works for you. Um, we also have some, um, uh, prescription strength anti-inflammatories that are not available over the counter. Um, these are called COX-2 inhibitors. So these are, for people that are going to be on anti-inflammatories regularly, these are probably safer. Um, they um, tend to um, cause less risk of stomach ulcers or affecting your kidney um, or causing bleeding. These are some of the side effects you can have from taking anti-inflammatories for a, a long term, a long period of time, and high doses, um, and these are all, and these are very good medications. Some people can't take anti-inflammatories because um, they're allergic, or they're on other medications that can interact with it. Um, in those cases, um, Tylenol is, you know, really the only other option over the counter, and that can work pretty well too. Uh, but if you can take anti-inflammatories, I encourage my patients to try those. Walking aids can help. Um, you know, whether it's a, a walker or, or even a cane, um, I think that can help people who are, um, are mobile, but maybe need some extra help on days where they're walking a lot or walking long distances. I think carrying a cane with you in those situations can be very helpful. Um, you know, the first half of the day, they'll do okay. And then the second half of the day, you know, things start to get pretty painful. And that's where having a cane um, or a walker 
can help take pressure off of that joint and allow you to continue to be active um, and not cause as much inflammation because you're able to take some of the pressure off that joint. Hot and cold therapy are good. Um, cold therapy is best after any type of activity. So whether that's exercise, whether that's you know uh, being on your feet all day at work, whether that's um, walking around at the store for a while, when that knee starts to get um, swollen and painful after activity, put some ice on it for 20 minutes at a time. And that cool, that um, the coolness from the ice will reduce the inflammation. If you put heat on a joint right after activity, it can actually cause the swelling and inflammation to become worse. So I think heat's good for the beginning of the day or maybe the end of the day when you've rested and you just kind of want to get the muscles to loosen up. But right after activity, I think cold, cold is, the be is your best bet. And that's going to get the inflammation to calm down. And then hopefully those people that get the inflammation at nighttime, that might not be as, as bad because we've got it to calm down a little bit with the ice. Exercising, I think, is very important um, it, for a few reasons. Um, you know, as the knee or hip starts to become painful, we start to become, we tend to start to be less active uh, because of the pain. Um, in, in that situation, our muscles will start to get weak. Um, you know, then we're, you know, our activity goes down even more. And when that starts to happen, uh, when we're not active, then the, our joints can become very stiff and it's a, really a vicious cycle. And then once the stiffness sets in, the pain is worse, then we're even less active. So I think it's important to, to have an exercise regimen. Uh, it doesn't have to be rigorous, but something where we're moving and stretching to keep that joint from getting stiff, keep our muscles active, keep the blood flow good to that area. And it helps to keep our weight down too. Um, we can do this many ways. We can do this with a formal phys physical therapy program, which I think can be very helpful for people to go in with a physical therapist and they'll put together a custom exercise program for them to do at home and give them good instruction on ways that they can be active and avoid aggravating existing joint pain. This can be done with just simple daily walking. And again, swimming is great. Biking is great. Anything, you know, other than, than um, running, I would say is good, good exercise. Knee injections are, are very, very popular. I do a lot of these as well. Um, the most popular injection that we give is cortisone. You now this is a steroid and a steroid is a very strong anti-inflammatory and we inject it directly into the near hip and that really gets in there and knocks out the inflammation much better than you know, an anti-inflammatory pill can on its own um, or even a steroid pill. We inject it directly into the joint. The other thing we do a lot of is uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, which is um, what you've probably heard called a uh, lubricating gel or a gel shot. And again, we, we inject these directly into the knee. They're only approved for the knee. We don't do these in hips or shoulders or anything like that. We can only uh, give these in the knee. They're only FDA approved for use in the knee. Um, and these work a little bit different than cortisone. So I actually like to use these together. When somebody comes in, I'll usually give them both cortisone and a lubricating gel. Whereas the cortisone gets in and knocks out the inflammation that's in there, the lubricating gel gets in between the bones and essentially you know, acts similar to motor oil. It gets in there and it lubricates up the two bones. So when you're walking, they're not grinding together as much. It helps to lubricate it. And when they're, the bones aren't grinding, they're not causing inflammation and pain. So it helps to prevent the inflammation, whereas the cortisone actually gets rid of it. Everybody responds differently to these. And you know, the farther along your arthritis is, the, the, the less response you'll get. So if somebody has very mild arthritis, these shots can last several months. Sometimes they'll last over a year. Occasionally, they'll last even more than that. But for somebody that's bone on bone, pretty severe arthritis, limping pretty bad, probably a few months, you know, maybe three, four, six months is about what we would expect to see. But everybody's different. It's hard to say for sure how your body is going to respond to it. Is there any questions, Julie? So far, there's none in the chat box or the Q&A. Okay. So cortisone lubricating gel, those are kind of some of the traditional 
um, injections that we use. And we're starting to use uh, a lot of alternative things that we call orthobiologics. So, and, and many of you probably have heard of these and we call them stem cells um, or PRP. So there's lots of different things we're looking at that are potentially more effective than, than cortisone. Cortisone has been around for a long time and it works well, but we're looking for things that are even more effective. So I've, I've been using a particular type of stem cell um, that we call Amnion. Um, and I like this because um, I don't have to harvest it from the patient. So there's some stem cell treatments where we actually stick a needle into your bone and remove your bone marrow and we get stem cells from there. And that can certainly work very well. Uh, this is nice because it comes from uh, a human placenta. The placenta is um, the structure that houses a fetus um, and grows the baby inside the mother for nine months. And, and it's full of nutrients and, and strong stimulators for growth and anti-inflammatories. And uh, essentially we, we take a specific part of it and we turn it into a powder and, and we can inject it into, the, into a painful joint. And it works very, very well to um, get rid of pain, to decrease inflammation. Uh, it's very safe. And again, I, I like it because it's really easy for me. I just mix it up in the office and give it. I don't have to put the patient through a procedure to, to harvest it from them. Um, what, you know, if, you, if you've read about stem cells on the internet, um, you may have read some things that um, you know, are potentially embellished or not true. I mean, I will say these are very, very good pain relievers. They, in my opinion, they work better than cortisone. But what they don't do is they don't regrow your cartilage. They're not going to cure your arthritis. Um, it's not a miracle drug, but it, it does work very, very well to decrease pain and inflammation. So I'm always very upfront with people about that because especially if somebody comes in asking about stem cells, they've already read about it. And, you know, it's important to set expectations. And unfortunately, I think there's some people out there that embellish what they can do a little bit. But again, these are very good very good drugs, um, but they're not going to cure your arthritis. We, we just don't have anything that can do that yet. Dr. MP, we have a question specific to this. Sure. Uh, can it be used anywhere besides the knee? Uh, absolutely. Um, we can use these in any joint in the body. Um, so I use these in hips. I use these in knees. I've used these in shoulders. Uh, you know, my partners that you know, our, let's say sports medicine specialists, for example, use them in all kinds of um, tendon injuries like tennis elbow or um, tendonitis of the knee. So anywhere where there's pain and inflammation, where you're trying to stimulate, you know, either, you know, both get rid of pain and inflammation and potentially stimulate a healing response, we found these medications to work very well. Um, now the downside so these currently is are not covered by insurance. So this is why they're not more widely used. So these are, these are items that people pay cash for and they're somewhat expensive because of you know, what it takes to, to harvest these. But, um, but I think in some circumstances, um, it really makes sense um, to do this, particularly somebody that is maybe younger and trying to delay surgery as much as po as long as possible and, and other forms of treatment aren't working for them anymore. Um, or somebody that's overweight, maybe needs to lose some weight before surgery and nothing's working for them. And we're just trying to control their pain for, you know, four or five, six months so they can get their weight down into a good spot. I've had a lot of success with using that in those situations. Looks like we have a few other questions there. Um, what is the difference between arthritic pain and rheumatic pain? Um, so I think if this is, if we're talking about different types of arthritis, um, so, you know, there's the most common type of arthritis is what we call osteoarthritis or wear and tear. And that's generally when you hear somebody say arthritis, that's what we're talking about. There's post-traumatic arthritis, which we talked about earlier, where there's an injury. And then there's also what we call inflammatory arthritis. So that can be caused by a lot of different conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis. These are diseases that people have where they actually, their body actually attacks their own cartilage. Um, so the end result is essentially the same, you know, you know, whether you have 
rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, or you had an injury, post-traumatic arthritis, the end result is that you have no cartilage left on the bone and you end up with a joint that is very painful and swollen. It's just different mechanisms to get there. So, you know, I think at the end, the pain feels the same, but it's just a different way of getting there. Um, and in all those situations, you know, we would, you know, we could end up treating them with joint replacement if necessary. Um, would this work for someone with multiple or dual types of arthritis? Um, yeah, I think any of these treatments can, can work for people with all the arthritis, you know, all the different types of arthritis that, you know, we discussed. Um, in addition, you know, some people may be on other medications for some of those um, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so we kind of take every situation differently, but um, cortisone is, is fairly safe when we do it. And a lot of people, and, and these stem cells are safe too. So it's pretty rare that we can't, you know, treat somebody with that. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we've just kind of gone through the basics of treatment for, for all these things. And this is generally, we, we try, you know, many of those, if not all of them uh, in patients beforehand. Uh, but let's say we've done all those things, still having a lot of pain, you know, what's, what do we do now? Well, this is when we start thinking about surgery. You know, when we haven't, when you haven't experienced adequate relief with the things that we just talked about. Um, so things that we consider when we're, when we're talking about it, you know, are you less active because of the joint pain? You know, a lot of people have arthritis and they're able to still do everything they want in their day. It's just their, their, their hip or knee or is kind of nagging and maybe they could take an ibuprofen and, and it goes away and are still able to do everything that they want to do. Um, and some people aren't, some people are started, you know, become significantly affected by it. They cut back on activities. They avoid certain activities. They have difficulty at work. They just, they have difficulty doing simple things such as going up and down the stairs. You know, they can't sleep anymore. But ultimately, you know, everyone's situation is different. And I just ask that, you know, my patients, does this keep you from doing the things that you want to do? And everybody's different in their activity level. Um, some people are, some people are not that active and, you know, they don't, um, um, you know, they can tolerate a lot more arthritis because they, they're not doing a lot of walking and things like that during the day. And so, you know, their joints aren't flaring up. So they can tolerate arthritis quite a bit longer um, than somebody that's extremely active. Now, some people have extremely active lifestyles. Um, they don't want to be slowed down at all. They're up and moving all the time. So those people are very sensitive to, to arthritis because they're up moving so much and that joint starts to get inflamed and then it starts to hold them back and they become very frustrated by that. So really, you know, I just, when we talk about it, we try to get to the core. Is this really starting to hold you back from your daily routine? Have you stopped doing your nightly walk? Have you stopped exercising, going to the gym? Have you stopped, you know, doing, you know, golfing or tennis or whatever that thing is that you like to do? Are you avoiding it or stopping it because of pain? So there's, there's different types of, of treatment options for, for, for knee arthritis. Um, and it depends on the kind of arthritis you have. So there's full knee replacements and partial knee replacements. We'll kind of talk about the difference here and the pros and cons of both. But, um, if you look on the left here, you can see this, this red area on, remember this white stuff is our smooth, shiny cartilage. You'll see this redness here. This is, this is arthritis. This is inflammation. This is areas where the bone is starting to come through, but you'll notice that it's only in one part of the knee when you compare it to the middle, where are we starting to see it up here? And then on the far right, you see it all over the place. So in this type of arthritis, which is sometimes in the earlier stages, we can actually treat this with a partial knee replacement. So we only replace this part of the knee where you have arthritis and we leave the rest of the knee alone. And this is what a partial knee will look like. We only put this, you know, gray, uh, this gray material is metal. Uh, metal, and then this is plastic here. So you notice there's only metal here, and then this is the rest of the natural knee. 
Now, if you look on the far right here, this is what a full knee replacement looks like. And that would be for people with arthritis all over the place. So you'll see here, there's metal that goes all the way across the knee on both you know, the top and the bottom and then a, a long piece of plastic. Most commonly, people have arthritis all over the knee. And um, so they get full knee replacements. But occasionally, you know, and I would say about 20% of my practice, uh, people have it in one area and they're good candidates for partial knee. So I always go through the different options, you know, depending on what your x-rays look like. So again, these are the questions we ask ourselves. We kind of went through those, um, you know, is it affecting, essentially, is it affecting you? Um, is it affecting your ability to do the things that you want to do uh, during your day? Are you frustrated by it? So we'll go, we'll talk about a full knee replacement first. This is what is, you know, we do most commonly. So just basic parts of the knee, um, the top part of the knee, we call that your, the femur, that's your thigh bone, your kneecap here, you know, the, the uh, medical term for that is your patella. And then on the bottom, we have uh, your tibia down here, which is uh, connected to your shin bone. Again, you can see what a normal knee looks like and what an arthritic knee looks like where that shiny white cartilage is worn away. Um, again, this is just kind of a brief review of the x-rays where we see a good space in between those bones. And then you look over here on the x-ray um, of an arthritic knee, there's no space at all between those bones. And again, this is just a good reminder that that, you know, even losing a little bit of weight can take a lot of pressure off of your knees. This is just a, this is a quick video about what a knee replacement looks like uh, at a very basic level, you know, during uh, surgery. So in surgery, we open up your knee and you can see that that rough bone, the arthritic bone, and you can see how it grinds against itself when it's bending. In surgery, we take saws and we cut the ends of these bones off and we put a metal cap on each side of it, okay? And we cut about a centimeter of bone. The thickness of these cuts is about one centimeter, okay? And this is essentially what a knee replacement is. We remove all of the, um, the bone and replace it with metal and plastic so that bone is no longer rubbing against itself. And that's what helps get rid of the pain and inflammation. So again, we've got two different types. We've got our partial knee replacement. Um, that's what that looks like. What you saw in the video was a full knee replacement where the knee went all the way across. We do about 700,000 knee replacements a year and that number keeps going up as uh, the baby boomer generation um, continues to age. So um, we think over the next 10 to 20 years, that number may even double. So there's a lot of, a lot of joint replacements that are being done and, and even more to come. So this is what an x-ray will look like after you've had surgery. So um, this is what that partial knee looks like. You can see this white uh, material here, that's the metal. Um, you can see it's only on one part of the knee. This part of the knee is still natural. We can't see the kneecap very well from here, but the, you know, we have the, the kneecap hasn't been replaced either. And this is a full knee replacement. It goes all the way across the knee um, on both sides, the top and the bottom. And so this is typically after surgery, this is, we'll go through these in the office and I'll, and I'll show you what your knee would look like. Um, this is the material that we use um, for our, our knee replacements. It's um, made out of cobalt and chromium. Um, so there are people out there that have, that can have um, a reaction to metals. These are people that have um, nickel allergies, okay? So it's always worth mentioning that to your surgeon um, because in, in the event that you have a nickel allergy, um, we'll oftentimes use a slightly different type of knee that's made out of different material because um, we don't want you to have a reaction to the metal. So we'll talk about hips a little bit here. Same concept as the knee. Um, this is your hip joint. It's a ball in a socket. You've got the smooth, shiny cartilage on the end of the bone here. Uh, and if you look on the other side here, again, same thing, that smooth, shiny cartilage is worn away. We've got redness, we've got inflammation, we've got bone-on-bone -bone arthritis of the hip there. 
Um, you know, the socket is part of your pelvis, this big bone here we call it is, we consider your pelvis and your socket sits in there, we call it the acetabulum. The ball is part of your femur, okay? So that's again, your, that's the top part of your thigh bone and we call that the femoral head. And there's the arthritis. So same concept as the knee, you know, we, we look for areas where the bone is touching, it's bone on bone. Um, this is a normal hip. So here's the ball, here's the socket, and we can see the space in between those two joints. That's very good. Now, if you look over here, again, you're not seeing any space between the joints. You see the two bones touching each other. And this is pretty severe, actually. You could, you know, this ball is no longer round. You can see here it's it's starting to become oblong and kind of flat. When you compare it to this, this is kind of a nice circle. This is actually starting to wear away and become flat. So the bone is, is grinded away enough that it's actually, the patient's actually starting to lose bone. Um, you know, arthritis is very common. This is the most common cause of disability in adults, most um, common causes of missed work. It's something that's very common and affects a lot of people in this country. This is a video uh, similar to the knee, just kind of really basic what a hip replacement looks like and what we do, essentially what we do during surgery. So we, we open up the hip and we, and we, we look at the ball in the socket joint. You can see this is very worn away and that ball is removed from the socket. And we actually take a saw and we cut that there and we remove it. We remove that arthritic bone. Then we put a new metal socket inside and a piece of plastic liner. And then we put a new ball inside the femur and we put it back together. So same thing as the knee, we have a completely artificial joint. There's no areas where the bone is rubbing bone anymore. And again, that's what allows us to get rid of the pain. So, um, you know, hips are a little bit less common. We do about twice as many knees as we do hips in this country. Um, so about three to 400,000 a year. Um, but again, still a lot, still a lot of people affected by this. This is what your hip replacement looks like on x-ray. So again, this is the, the, the bright material is, is the metal. We can see the, the new socket here, and then we can see the new ball and that attaches to the, the thigh bone, the femur. Um, we use, in order to attach this to your bone, we wedge these metal parts in pretty tightly. And we used to use a lot of cement to hold it to the bone in the, in the hip, but we don't so much anymore. We have these amazing materials where it wedges into the bone and then the bone actually grows onto the metal. So the metal hip actually becomes part of your body. And we found um, in general that that could potentially last longer than if we used cement to hold it together. That was kind of a traditional way that we, we did it. And the cement can work very well, but I think long-term, this is the better option. Uh, there's still some occasions where we will use cement and in very specific situations, I think, I think it, it works well. But, and sometimes I have patients that previously had a hip done years ago and they come back and have it done with me and they ask where the, the glue, the bone glue or the cement is. And we just don't use it very often anymore in hip replacement. So again, these are the, these are the parts of the hip replacement. We've got the socket that goes in, the, the, the plastic liner. Um, the ball in most cases nowadays, we actually made of ceramic, that's why it's pink. Um, and we found that ceramic actually works a little bit better than metal uh, in some patients. And then we have our metal stem. This rough material here, this is what goes inside the bone. You can see some rough material here, rough material. That's where the bone actually grows in. So it's, it's really rough like sandpaper, but it, it, it has material on it that attracts the bone to grow onto it. So if any of you have looked into hip replacement in the past, you may have read about some different ways to do it. Um, you may have read about minimally invasive hip replacement. You may have read about minimally invasive knee replacements as well. But I would say, if, you know, as far as information on the internet go, the, you know, uh, information about minimally invasive hips is very prominent. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, I do it a couple of different ways. Um, and, but, you know, typically anytime I'm, you know, whatever way I'm doing it, I'm doing it minimally invasive. 
And, you know, this is allows most of my patients to go home the same day as surgery. Um, but one of the, one of the traditional ways to do it is called the posterior approach. Posterior means the back. Um, and the traditional way to do, you can see the, these purple dots is this very long incision we used to do um, when we did it posteriorly. Um, and that, that's when we used to keep people in the hospital for several days, sometimes, you know, a week or more, and then they would go to a nursing home or a rehab facility, um, for a few weeks. And then, um, you know, nowadays we do things through much less, uh, you know, much smaller incision. You can see here how much smaller this example of incision is than this one. This would be, you know, the size of the incision I would use if I were to do a posterior approach. Um, if you read on the internet, you read about the posterior approach, you might read that it's, um, you know, it, you can't have a quick recovery if you do it. And I think, I don't think that's true. I think people, when they're describing that, are describing the, the old traditional way we used to do it, not the minimally invasive way that, that I do it, uh, you know, which is kind of the modern way to do it. But again, we, in most cases, we do this through a small incision. Um, we are able to get our patients up walking the same day of surgery. And in many cases, we get them home the same day. And so the advantage of small incision is, you know, we're cutting less muscle and tendon, less pain, less blood loss, less swelling, um, less weakness. So we're able to get people up moving a lot faster than we used to. The other way that you, um, if you've looked at hip replacement, uh, is probably read about the anterior approach, which is kind of the, the more, uh, I would say the more popular uh, way to do it nowadays. Um, and I do a lot of this in my practice as well. Um, there's, I think, uh, advantages to doing it anteriorly and anterior means front. So we make our incision in the front rather than the back. Um, there might be some, there might be a, uh, a little bit less pain, but I would say, honestly, I don't notice much difference between the two. Um, but there, and there might be a little bit less chance of the ball popping out of the socket after surgery, which, which we call a dislocation. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to doing it both way. And when I have patients in the office, we go through the advantages to both. And so I kind of do it both ways to, to sort of tailor make an experience for my patient, what I think is the best opportunity for them to recover well. And that can depend on a lot of factors, and mostly what the patient's anatomy looks like. Everybody's anatomy is a little bit different. And because of that, each of these ways to do a hip, they have their pros and they have their cons. So that's something we always have a discussion about. And I always love to hear the patient's input too, because a lot of people have done their homework on it. So it's, we have some really fun conversations. Uh, but in either case, we're doing it minimally invasive. In either case, you're up walking the same day. And in most cases, you're home the same day or maybe an overnight stay in the hospital. So that's kind of the general run through of, of joint replacements. Um, now, I'm really excited to talk to you about using robotics. So I use robotics in my practice to do hip and knee replacements. And I think there's a lot of advantages to doing it this way over the traditional way. So with robotics, you know, I use the same parts uh, that you know, I just talked about. But the robot allows me to plan for the case, allows me to put those same parts in in a much more precise way than I could without it. So I'm much, um, it's much easier for me to, to match a patient's anatomy. Uh, and I'll show you how, how that can be done here in just a minute. But um, this robot, it's important to point out, this is a tool I use in surgery. It's not like an automated thing where I, I push a button and walk out of the room and the robot does a little case for you. But uh, we don't have anything like that at this, at this point, but it's a, it's a great tool that I use. I'm in, I'm in control of it the whole time during surgery. Um, so, you know, robotics has been around for a little while now. Uh, it's been around for a few years. We've done a lot of cases with it. We've done a lot of hip replacements. We've done a lot of knee replacements. And this is kind of a busy slide, but I think, this is just showing there's a lot of, of studies showing the advantages to doing it where we see, you know, potentially lower pain scores. We see um, less pain and swelling. We potentially see quicker recovery. We see things just feeling more natural. And all of that is because of how precise um, the robot is uh, while I put the joint, while I put the implants in during surgery. 
So the robot's been around 14 plus years now. There's been almost 150 research papers published published on it. Um, you know, there's probably over a thousand of these robots in the country now. Um, I'm sure there's more. There's probably half half a million of these robotic procedures that have been done. These this, these numbers are from two years ago. And the popularity of the robot has grown a lot in the last two years as physicians are starting to see the uh, benefits of using a robot and have gotten their hospitals to, to get one for them. So this is just kind of a very basic video to show you how a robot works. How, how do I use this in surgery and, and oops. There we go. So you can see um, this is this would be an example of a knee. Oh, let me get back there. So this is a really, I'm just gonna pause it for a second. This is one of the very unique things about using a robot. So traditionally we would just, we would use x-rays that we got in the office, which were two dimensional. And as you just heard with this, with the robot, we get this CAT scan before surgery and we build this 3D virtual model of your knee for surgery. And you can see, we're looking at a three dimensional model of it from, from all different angles. Um, these numbers, you know, it's not important that you know what they mean, but, but basically, you know, these numbers are millimeters. This is millimeters of bone that we're going to take off when we make the cut. So this is precise, so precise that we're, we're taking bone off in increments of one millimeter. You know, we can go, you know, we can add a millimeter, we can take a millimeter away. This is precision that I, you know, absolutely would not be able to do with my own naked eye. And you can see here, this green here, this is the metal of the implant. So this is the planning screen that I have before surgery. So I go in here and I sit down and I go through very carefully and I map out exactly, I know exactly what size your knee parts are gonna be. I know exactly how much they need to be rotated to fit you. I know what, exactly what angles that these are gonna go in to fit you. And this is something we cannot do with, with two dimensional x-rays alone. So in a traditional knee replacement, we open up the knee uh, or hip and we start measuring and we essentially sort of guess at the sizes um, and we kind of trial and error until we find the one that we think fits the best. Um, whereas this, I know exactly ahead of time that it's going to be the perfect size. It's going to fit you like a glove and it's going to match your anatomy. And all of those things, I think, help lead to this knee feeling more natural at the end of your recovery. So here again, this is another very unique and important part of the robotic case. So um, in surgery, I'm looking at this screen again. So I've already opened up the knee and um, now I'm looking at it and I, I can look and I can see, you know, do we have the knee where we want it to be? So let's say somebody's extremely bow legged and we can measure it and it's, you know, they've got 10 degrees of, of bow legged. Uh, and they're 10 degrees bow legged. I can, I know in surgery if I've corrected this or not, because the robot will tell me again, these numbers aren't important, but you can see these degrees here. Um, you know, we can plan it for zero and that, then we know that we've gotten 
the exact amount of, of correction we need to, we know that the leg is straight. And for and in, a, in this example, they're at two degrees, so they're not quite at zero yet. So at this point, I haven't made any cuts to the bone. I can go back and I can readjust my plan so that I can dial this into zero. Again, in, in traditional knee replacement, I would just eyeball and guess, and we would usually be close, you know, and, and pretty close, but it would be within a few degrees. And with this, we can dial it in down to the degree, which is the precision of that is amazing. So you can see here the surgeon's hands holding the saw. This is how we make the cuts in the bone. I hold the saw and I pull the trigger to turn it on and I push it in and it cuts the bone. But you can see these, this green line coming out. This is sort of an imaginary line, but um, the robot will not let me go outside of these lines. I, it will only let me go in one plane. I can push as hard as I want. It will not allow me to bring the saw way over here and cut a ligament. It, it keeps me only in the area where there's bone, which is, is really nice. So it keeps the saw from wandering off, keeps you from taking more bone than you want. So again, that precision is really nice. And I'm in control of it, but it's, but, and I'm guiding it, but it keeps me exactly where I wanna be. So again, just a recap, we get, we get your CAT scan before surgery, and this applies to the hip as well. We get, a, we get the CAT scan before surgery. We build a 3D model. We plan all of this out. This is before I even go into the operating room. In surgery, once we open the knee up, um, we look at it again, and we look at our plan, and we make adjustments so that we can um, make the leg straight or put it wherever it is, whatever our goal is. Um, and you know, correct as much as we can and, and know that we're doing it in a very precise way. We're good. We have a goal in mind and the robot allows me to hit that goal with precision. And then we use the saw that's guided by the robot arm to remove only the bone that we plan for and that 3D model. And then we put our parts in. Okay, any, any questions about that at this point? So far there are none. So this is what we spend, honestly, most of our time talking about in the office. Uh, we talk, you know, we talk about surgery and the robot, but most people want to talk about the recovery. And I think most people, you know, are, are apprehensive to some point about having a surgery. And I think, you know, it's natural to feel nervous about getting a surgery and things like that. I mean, everybody feels that way. Uh, but a lot of people have seen family members or friends go through joint replacement in the past, especially knee replacement. And, you know, even 10 years ago, the first, you know, the early stages of it were kind of rough, to be honest. People had a lot of pain. They weren't very active. Uh, once they got through that initial period, they did great. You know, it's a life-changing surgery. They got them back to being active. But, you know, if you saw a friend or family member go through that first few weeks, you know, I could understand being apprehensive about it. So that's a lot of what we talk about is what that process is going to be like. And that process has changed a lot. Um, now we're doing things minimally invasive. Um, we're, we're getting people up and moving sooner. People have much pain than they used to. Um, so a lot of the, what I do is reassuring people that you know, they, they will absolutely be able to get through the recovery. And there's a good chance it's gonna be a lot easier than what they saw a friend or family member go through in the past. I don't, you know, I'm not gonna lie and say that there's no pain because there is, but I think it's much more manageable than it used to be. And I've had many, many patients get one knee done and then they come back and right away have the second one done um, because they're like, you know what? That wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. So, but the general course of plan is um, we have you in for surgery. Again, most people are out on the same day or maybe they stay overnight. Um, 
most most patients nowadays are are able to recover at home. Um, so we have nurses and therapists come out to the house um, for the first two weeks, um, which I think people really like. Um, at the end of the day, they, they feel comfort being at home, especially if they have family members there with them. And it's nice that they can have uh, you know people to their house to work with them there. And they don't have to go out and drive anywhere. Uh, then at two weeks, we generally will see in the office and we'll make sure everything's you know, going well, the wounds healing nicely. And we get an x-ray and we go through, we show it to you and talk about it. And then we start outpatient physical therapy. And then we see a few more times, um, during that, during that course. And, you know, it takes a couple weeks before people are starting to get rid of, you know, you start off on a walker for a week or two, and then you go on to a cane for a couple of weeks. But usually by about three to four weeks, people are starting to get rid of the cane. They're starting to drive, um, you know, and that is when people start kind of start to start to turn turn a corner in the recovery. They start to drive. They're feeling good. They're starting maybe going back to the gym a little bit. Maybe they're, um, you know, going to run small errands or maybe starting to go out and, and um, take their nightly walks again. Not quite as far as they were before, but they're getting out there and starting it. Some people are starting to go back to work at that point at desk jobs. You're not 100% by that four-week point or that six-week point, but well on your way. Uh, at that point, you've made about 60% of your recovery. Um, by three months, people are pretty much back to doing everything. They're golfing. They're playing tennis. People that work as carpenters are starting to climb ladders again. But to get to that level of activity, it does take about three months. You know, it takes much less time to walk and do basic things. But when you start talking about um, climbing a ladder, that requires a lot of strength and balance. And it could take a few months to get to that point. Um, people ask a lot about golf. Um, you know, there's an interesting study that just came out where it takes about four months before people, four to four and a half months before people, on average, are ready to walk 18 holes of golf, which is a couple of miles. So, the process goes on for a few months, but getting back to basic daily life, it certainly doesn't take that long. And you're feeling the benefits of the knee replacement well before that. So again, you know, we just kind of went through all of that, but you know, in the hospital, same day, or maybe one, sometimes two days, and then, you know, daily activities, really three to six weeks. And then, you know, ongoing to get back to that really rigorous activity that some people like to do can take a few months. Everyone's a little bit different. But, you know, at the end of the day, what we're, what we're trying to do is get you back to doing what you love. And that's, it goes back to the initial conversation we had, when am I ready for joint replacement? And again, you know, the, the time to do it is when you can't do those things that you love, whatever that is, if it's walking, if it's golfing, if it's biking, when you can't do those things anymore that you love that, you know, make you enjoy life, you know, that's when it's time to think about it. Um, but, you know, these, um, the joint replacement is not a bionic joint replacement. So it's not going to make you stronger than you were before. It's not going to make you better at golf or tennis than you were before. Um, you know, but it's going to allow you to get back to doing those things. You know, everybody has these surgeries for different reasons. And, um, you know, it, as my job as a surgeon to, to, you know, educate people on, on, um, you know, things that could potentially cause harm to them and their, and their surgery. So, you know, we, I, I caution people to avoid or potentially avoid, or at least be very mindful about activities that could cause a lot of stress on a joint replacement. I am pretty, you know, I, I, I do recommend people not run routinely for exercises in, you know, 20, 30 miles a week. Cause that certainly can like any other mechanical part can, it can cause it to wear out faster than it's intended. Just like if you were to drive a car really hard, it's going to wear out before you would, if you drove it normal. Um, but I have a lot of patients that do things like ski or play pickup basketball and things like that. And you just tell them, you know, this, you can do it as long as you, you know, your, your knee or hip will hold up to it. 
But if you have a hard fall, you know, you could, you could injure your joint replacement. You could break the bone around it. You can have the hip pop out of socket. You know, those, those are the risks to it. But at the end of the day, if, if, as long as, you know, you understand that and skiing is a thing that you love to do on this, on this world. And I don't want to stand in, in between you and doing that. Um, but there are just certain things that we have to talk about that, you know, you could be risk for hurting it, but I have lots of patients that ski and do those things and they're happy. And that's at the end of the day, that's what I want for them. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Um, again, I'm, I'm Dr. Emke um, with Inzale Orthopedics. There's my phone number there, my website. Uh, I've got lots of information um, on my website about um, surgery options and, and a lot of the things I went through and some other things as well. Um, again, I'm, I do a lot of these surgeries over at the Center for Advanced Joint Replacement at LaGrange Hospital and, and our surgery center in Westmont. So, um, you know, and if you ever want to come in and talk to me about any of these things, please uh, give us a call and I'll be happy to see you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. MK. We really appreciate you having your time today and being able to, to share your knowledge with us. Um, just one last, are there any other questions that we have for Dr. Emke while we have him here? All right, it looks like there is nothing in the chat box. So again, Dr. Emke, thank you very much. Julie at Stryker, thank you very much for joining us as well today. Uh, and have a wonderful day and keep those joints safe. Okay, thanks, Katie. All righty, have a great day, everyone.